Today, our story is The Fairy Goose by the highly acclaimed Irish writer Liam O'Flaherty, 1897 to 1984. It tells of a time when the simple and ancient folk beliefs of village dwellers in Ireland still gave comfort to many, while existing uneasily with the all-encompassing powers of the mighty Church of Rome and its ever-vigilant foot soldiers, the parish priests, ever ready to stamp out aberrations from Orthodox religion. Their power over hearts and minds was real, and their disapproval greatly to be feared. I'm your reader, Kim Dodsworth. An old woman named Mary Wiggins got three goose eggs from a neighbour in order to hatch a clutch of goslings. She put an old clucking hen over the eggs in a wooden box with a straw bed. The hen proved to be a bad sitter. She was continually deserting the eggs, possibly because they were too big. The old woman then kept her shut up in the box. Either through weariness, want of air, or simply through pure devilment, the hen died on the eggs, two days before it was time for the shells to break. The old woman shed tears of rage, both at the loss of her hen, of which she was particularly fond, and through fear of losing her goslings. She put the eggs near the fire in the kitchen, wrapped up in straw and old clothes. Two days afterwards, one of the eggs broke, and a tiny gosling put out its beak. The other eggs proved not to be fertile. They were thrown away. The little gosling was a scraggy thing, so small and so delicate that the old woman, out of pity for it, wanted to kill it. But her husband said, Kill nothing that is born in your house, woman, alive. It's against the law of God. It's a true saying, my honest fellow, said the old woman. What comes into the world is sent by God. Praise be he. For a long time, it seemed certain that the gosling was on the point of death. It spent all the day on the hearth in the kitchen, nestling among the peat ashes, either sleeping or making little tweaky noises. When it was offered food, it stretched out its beak and pecked without rising off its stomach. Gradually, however, it became hardier and went out of doors to sit in the sun on a flat rock. When it was three months old, it was still a yellowish colour with soft down, even though other goslings of that age in the village were already going to the pond with the flock and able to flap their wings and join in the cackle at evening time, when the setting sun was being saluted. The little gosling was not aware of the other geese, even though it saw them rise on windy days and fly with a great noise from their houses to the pond. It made no effort to become a goose, and at four months it still could not stand on one leg. The old woman came to believe it was a fairy. The village woman agreed with her after some dispute. It was decided to tie pink and red ribbons around the gosling's neck and to sprinkle holy water on its wing feathers. That was done, and then the gosling became sacred in the village. No boy dare throw a stone at it or pull a feather from its wing as they were in the habit of doing with geese, in order to get masts for the pieces of cork they floated in the pond as ships. When it began to move about, every house gave it dainty things. All the human beings in the village paid more respect to it than they did to one another. The little gosling had contracted a great affection for Mary Wiggins and followed her around everywhere, so that Mary Wiggins also came to have the reputation of being a woman of wisdom. Dreams were brought to her for unraveling. She was asked to set the spell of the big periwinkle and to tie the knot of the snakes on the sides of sick cows. And when children were ill, the gosling was brought secretly at night and led three times around the house on a thin halter of horsehair. When the gosling was a year old, it had not yet become a goose. Its down was still slightly yellowish. It didn't cackle, but made curious tweaky noises. Instead of stretching out its neck and hissing at strangers after the manner of a proper goose, it put its head to one side and made funny noises like a duck. It meditated like a hen, was afraid of water, and cleansed itself by rolling on the grass. It fed on bread, fish, and potatoes. It drank milk and tea. It amused itself by collecting pieces of cloth, nails, small fish bones, and the limpid shells that are thrown in a heap beside dunghills. 
these pieces of refuse it placed in a pile to the left of Mary Wiggins' door. And when the pile was tall, it made a sort of nest in the middle of it, and lay in the nest. Old Mrs. Wiggins had by now realized that the goose was worth money to her. So she became firmly convinced that the goose was gifted with supernatural powers. She accepted, in return for setting spells, a yard of white frieze cloth for unraveling dreams, a pound of sugar for setting the spell of the big periwinkle, and half a donkey's load of potatoes for tying the knot of the snakes on a sick cow's sides. Hitherto, a kindly, humorous woman, she took to wearing her shawl in a triangular fashion, with the tip of it reaching to her heels. She talked to herself, or to her goose, as she went along the road. She took long steps like a goose, and rolled her eyes occasionally. When she cast a spell, she went into an ecstasy, during which she made inarticulate sounds like, Boom! Room! Toom! Croom! Soon it became known all over the countryside that there was a woman of wisdom and a fairy goose in the village, and pilgrims came secretly from afar at the dead of night, on the first night of the new moon, or when the spring tide had begun to wane. The men soon began to raise their hats, passing old Mary Wiggins's house, for it was understood, owing to the cure of Dara Foddy's cow, that the goose was indeed a good fairy, and not a malicious one. Such was the excitement in the village and all over the countryside that what was kept secret so long at last reached the ears of the parish priest. The story was brought to him by an old woman from a neighboring village to that in which the goose lived. Before the arrival of the goose, the other old woman had herself cast spells, not through her own merits, but through those of her dead mother, who had a long time ago been the woman of wisdom in the district. The priest mounted his horse as soon as he heard the news, and galloped at a breakneck speed towards Mary Wiggins's house, carrying his breviary and his stall. When he arrived in the village, he dismounted at a distance from the house, gave his horse to a boy, and put his stall around his neck. A number of the villagers gathered, and some tried to warn Mary Wiggins by whistling at a distance, but conscious that they had all taken part in something forbidden by the sacred laws of orthodox religion, they were afraid to run ahead of the priest into the house. Mary Wiggins and her husband were within, making little ropes of brown horsehair which they sold as charms. Outside the door, perched on a high nest, the little goose was sitting. There were pink and red ribbons around her neck, and around her legs there were bands of black tape. She was quite small, a little more than half the size of a normal healthy goose. But she had an elegant charm of manner, an air of civilization, and a consciousness of great dignity, which had grown out of the respect and love of the villagers. When she saw the priest approach, she began to cackle gently, making the tweaky noise that was peculiar to her. She descended from her perch and waddled towards him, expecting some dainty gift. For everybody who approached her gave her a dainty gift. But instead of stretching out his hand to offer her something and saying, Bidai, Bidai, come here, as was customary, the priest halted and muttered something in a harsh, frightened voice. He became red in the face, and he took off his hat. Then, for the first time in her life, the little goose became terrified. She opened her beak, spread her wings, and lowered her head. She began to hiss violently. Turning around, she waddled back to her nest, flapping her wings and raising a loud cackle, just like a goose, although she had never been heard to cackle loudly like a goose before. Clambering up to her high nest, she lay there quite flat, trembling violently. The bird, never having known fear of human beings, never having been treated with discourtesy, was so violently moved by the extraordinary phenomenon of a man wearing black clothes, scowling at her and muttering, that her animal nature was roused and showed itself with disgusting violence. The people watching the scene were astounded. Some took off their caps and crossed themselves. For some reason, it was made manifest to them that the goose was an evil spirit, and not the good fairy which they had supposed her to be. Terrified of the priest's stole and breviary, and of his scowling countenance, they were only too eager to attribute the goose's strange hissing and her still stranger cackle to supernatural forces of an evil nature. Some present even caught a faint rumble of thunder in the east, and although it was not noticed at the time, 
An old woman later asserted that she heard a great cackle of strange geese, afar off, raised in answer to the little fairy goose's cackle. It was, said the old woman, certainly the whole army of devils offering her help to kill the holy priest. The priest turned to the people and cried, raising his right hand in a threatening manner. I wonder the ground doesn't open up and swallow you all, idolaters. Oh, Father, blessed by the hand of God, cried an old woman, the one who later asserted that she had heard the devilish cackle afar off. She threw herself on her knees in the road. Spare us, Father. Old Mrs. Wiggins, having heard the strange noises, rushed out into the yard with her triangular shawl trailing and her black hair loose. She began to make vague, mystic movements with her hands, as had recently become a habit with her. Lost in some sort of ecstasy, she didn't see the priest at first. She began to chant something. You hag! cried the priest, rushing up the yard towards her, menacingly. The old woman caught sight of him and screamed, but she faced him boldly. Come no farther, she cried, still in an ecstasy, either affected or the result of a firm belief in her own mystic powers. Indeed, it is difficult to believe that she was not in earnest, for she used to be a kind, gentle woman. Her husband rushed out, crying aloud. Seeing the priest, he dropped a piece of rope he had in his hand and fled around the corner of the house. Leave my way, you hag, cried the priest, raising his hand to strike her. Stand back, she cried. Don't lay a hand on my goose. Leave my way, yelled the priest, or I'll curse you. Curse, then, cried the unfortunate woman. Curse. Instead, the priest gave her a blow under the ear, which filled her smartly. Then he strode up to the goose's nest and seized the goose. The goose, paralyzed with terror, was just able to open her beak and hiss at him. He stripped the ribbons off her neck and tore the tape off her feet. Then he threw her out of the nest. Seizing a spade that stood by the wall, he began to scatter the refuse of which the nest was composed. The old woman, lying prostrate in the yard, raised her head and began to chant in the traditional fashion used by women of wisdom. I'll call on the winds of the east and of the west. I'll raise the waves of the sea. The lightning will flash in the sky, and there'll be great sounds of giants warring in the heavens. Light will fall on the earth, and calves with fishes' tails will be born of cows. The little goose, making tweaky noises, waddled over to the old woman and tried to hide herself under the long shawl. The people murmured at this, seeing in it fresh signs of devilry. Then the priest threw down the spade and hauled the old woman to her feet, kicking aside the goose. The old woman, exhausted by her ecstasy and possibly seeking to gain popular support, either went into a faint or feigned one. Her hands and her feet hung limply. Again the people murmured. The priest, becoming embarrassed, put her sitting against the wall. Then he didn't know what to do, for his anger had exhausted his reason. He either became ashamed of having beaten an old woman, or he felt the situation was altogether ridiculous. So he raised his hand and addressed the people in a sorrowful voice. Let this be a warning, he said sadly. This poor woman, all of you, led astray by foolish and... Avarice is at the back of this, he cried suddenly in an angry voice, shaking his fist. This woman had been preying on your credulity in order to extort money from you by her pretended sorcery. That's all it is. Money is at the back of it. But I give you warning. If I hear another word about this, I'll... He paused uncertainly, wondering what to threaten the poor people with. Then he added, I'll report it to the Archbishop of the Diocese. The people raised a loud murmur, asking forgiveness. Fear God, he added finally, and love your neighbors. Then throwing a stone angrily at the goose, he strode out of the yard and left the village. It was then that the people began to curse violently and threatened to burn the old woman's house. The responsible people among them, however, chiefly those who had hitherto paid no respect to the superstition concerning the goose, restrained their violence. Finally, the people went home, and Mary Wigan's husband, who had been hiding in a barn, came and brought his wife indoors. The little goose, uttering cries of amazement, began to collect the rubbish once more, piling it into a heap in order to rebuild her nest. That night, 
just after the moon had risen, a band of young men collected, approached Mary Wiggins' house, and enticed the goose from her nest by calling, Beat I, beat I, come here, come here. The little goose, delighted that people were again kind and respectful to her, waddled down to the gate, making happy noises. The youths stoned her to death. And the little goose never uttered a sound. So terrified and amazed was she at this treatment from people who had formerly loved her and whom she had never injured. Next morning, when Mary Wiggins discovered the dead carcass of the goose, she went into a fit, during which she cursed the village, the priest, and all mankind. And indeed it appeared that her blasphemous prayer took some effect at least. Although giants did not war in the heavens, and although cows did not give birth to fishes, it's certain that from that day the natives of that village are quarrelsome drunkards who fear God but don't love one another. And the old woman is again collecting followers from among the wives of the drunkards. These women maintain that the only time in the history of their generation that there was peace and harmony in the village was during the time when the fairy goose was loved by the people. And that story was The Fairy Goose by Liam O'Flaherty, 1897-1984. I hope you'll tune in again this time next week when I'll have another short story of quality for you. Until then, bye for now.